I am recording. All right. I will now call to order the Tuesday, February 9th, 2021 meeting of the Bloomington Housing and Redevelopment Authority to order. First item on the agenda is a roll call of attendees. I will now call the roll call of attendees. Beloga. Beloga. Pugheem. Present. Lewis. Present. Olson. Present. And Thorson is present. Uh, let the record show that at least at the beginning of the uh, meeting, um, Commissioner Beloga is uh, not present. Everyone else is present. Um, next on the ag agenda is approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? Commissioner Lewis, I move to approve the agenda. Commissioner Hukim seconds. Uh, motion by Lewis, second by Hukim to approve the agenda. I will now do a roll call vote. Hukim? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Olson? Aye. And Thorson is an aye. Motion passes unanimously. On to the approval of minutes. The first one we have is approval of the January 19th, uh, 2023 special meeting minutes. Do we have any? Uh, 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 edits or questions about the minutes or discussion? Commissioner Thorson? Yes. It is, you indicated it was the 2023 minutes. It's actually still only 2021. What? Did you I just said, you said 2023. Did I say, really? All right, well, yeah. 2021 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to go, I don't want to go any, faster and get any older any faster than I have to. So um, that works for all of us. Do we are breaking up? He's muted. Chair Thorson, you're muted. Thank you. Right. Um did I hear a motion in a second? No. Do we have a motion to approve Commissioner Hukim makes the motion to approve the January 19, 2021 HRA Commission Special Meeting Minutes. Commissioner Olson seconds. Yeah. I will have a motion by Hukim, second by Olson. I will now do the roll call vote. Hukim? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Olson? Aye. And as an I motion passes unanimously on to the January 26, 2021 commission meeting minutes, regular meeting. <clears throat> Is there any discussion of those minutes? If not, I'd look for a motion. Commissioner Olson uh, moves approval of those minutes. Commissioner Lewis, second. Motion by Olson, second by Lewis. I will now do the roll call vote. Hugheem? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Olson? Aye. Thorson is aye. Motion passes unanimously. On to organizational business. Uh, uh, item 4.1, strategic planning continuation special meeting scheduled. Are there any comments on that? Chair Thorson, Erica Coleman, HR Administrator. This is just uh, reiterating and going through that we have scheduled the special session for the strategic planning for next week, um, February, sorry, uh, February 16th. I was thrown off by the date I'm seeing here. Um, and so just, just reiterating that and just reminding our commissioners that we did that, that meeting and approved the calendar at our last meeting, last regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, which included the special meeting. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and it is, uh, again, I would encourage everyone to uh, attend if and it's a very important uh, meeting. And uh, I'm sure we'll be getting materials ahead of time to, uh, uh, to uh, facilitate our discussion at the meeting. Um, on to new business, item 5.1, opportunity housing ordinance amendments. Could we have the staff report, please? Yes, thank you. Good evening, Chair Thorson, Commissioners. Please give me a moment to pull up the presentation.
I suppose I have to remember to share my screen first. Oh, can you see it already? I can see it. All right, good. I can see it. Yep, I can see it. Everyone can see it now. Great. Thank you. We are bringing before you this evening the proposed amendments to the opportunity housing ordinance. They are being presented tonight to the HRA for a uh, approval and recommendation to the city council to approve. They will go to the planning commission on February 25th and the city council on March 8th. This timeline is important. Uh, we very much hope that the city council will approve the ordinance changes in March because we have 8012 Old Cedar, the Reuter Walton uh, proposed development coming through in March and April. And it's imperative that um, the ordinance changes that allow them to um, build a 68 unit development on a smaller lot at 80th and Old Cedar um, that they can meet their deadline. They they received $11 million um, in bonds in, in January. And once again, we have a July 1st deadline. So we are hopefully moving the opportunity housing ordinance forward um, in, in a in a reasonable timeline in order to assist that development in retaining um, their $11 million in, in bonds from the state. As we uh, are all very committed to the opportunity housing ordinance to promote the development of new affordable housing the, and the preservation of existing naturally occurring affordable housing while also furthering private market development in the city. The ordinance was adopted, um, it, it was set forth um, by the city council and adopted on February 25th of 2019, amended um, in August of 2019, and as you all know, launched on September 1st of 2019. The Opportunity Housing Ordinance Annual Report to the City Council was presented on August 10th, 2020 along with additional joint study sessions with the Housing and Redevelopment Authority on September 21st and October 22nd. Um, those are the um, main conversations um, that led to the proposed uh, recommendations that are before you this evening, as long as, as and along with previous community engagement sessions um, with the Bloomington Housing Action Team, both in 2020 and again um, today. And we also will be scheduling a meeting between now and the City Council public hearing date, hopefully with property owners through the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association and housing developers through ULI. Um, also last fall, Twin Cities LISC held several um, uh, meetings for developers, property owners, other governments, uh, the philanthropic sector, and um, Bloomington residents. So we have a lot of great feedback um, on the proposed changes to date. The, there are four types of proposed amendments. One are future considerations that we will, with one exception, not be discussing today or with this um, series of amendments. The second are minor edits. Those are typos or exchanging a may for a shall. Um, those are things we will not be discussing today, but the clarifications and the changes will be um, the topic of today's discussion. The clarifications are in the section for definitions, the opportunity housing requirement, payment in lieu, affordable housing tools and incentives and objectives. The first clarification is to clearly define the terms for um, implementation and flexibility, especially affordable, affordable rents and income limits. These definitions are being elaborated on to more clearly match the HUD 
definition and the Metropolitan Council definition of affordable, affordable rents and income limits. And to note, this does include fees and costs in the calculation of affordable rent. This will give developers flexibility in how they cash flow and finance their projects, while at the same time ensuring that our affordability requirements and outcomes are met. This is um, 9.4 in the definition section. 9.6 is the opportunity housing requirement. Staff recommends that new multifamily residential units include newly constructed, converted, or infilled development. This allows for the development of housing converted from commercial, office, hotel, or other uses. 9.09 payment in lieu. Staff recommends further defining how and when the developer make a payment of the fee in lieu and also defines that the payment of the fee in lieu is deposited in the affordable housing trust fund for future development preservation or writing the cost down um, to a lower deeper income level. This provides the city with additional assurance of receiving the fee while allowing the developer to retain the funds during construct the construction period of the first phase if as needed. This is not, uh, that is just a clarification, not a major change to the ordinance. There is an important future consideration, however, and that is that the cur current payment in lieu rate is $9.60. This was set by the economic impact study and staff is recommending that this be updated every three to five years to ensure the city is capturing eligible costs. We did have a conversation with Bay Area Economics um, regarding the updating of the fee payment of the fee in lieu. Um, in addition to the three to five years, there could be some major shift in the housing market that um, would necessitate uh, a revision as well, but even in the pandemic, affordable housing development is going strong, and um, this is something that we do not think um, needs to occur, occur every year. 9.15 tools and incentives. Um, this would allow uh, city the city council to approve any additional um, combination of measures that would increase the number of units that are affordable, but may currently deviate from requirements outlined by the opportunity housing ordinance. Once again, this would be um, by city council approval. 9.36 objectives. The one of the um, most important objectives of the ordinance is that the affordable housing units are integrated um, throughout the city as well as throughout proposed developments. This clarification also adds that the affordability of the unit sizes proposed be integrated in whatever bedroom types the um, development proposes. So if there are three and four bedroom units in the property as a whole, there must be three and four bedroom units um, that are affordable as well. And this more clearly uh, clarifies, of course, the um, city and the HRA's intent to potential developers. Moving on to the changes, there are changes in the opportunity housing requirement, changes to the tools and incentives, changes in the in financial incentives, changes to the height bonus, the parking reduction, enclosed parking space conversion allowance, alternative exterior materials allowance, and the storage space reduction. The first change is to the opportunity housing requirement. Staff recommends that for new single family residential developments that they must be affordable at 115% AMI instead of 110% AMI. 
This does not mean that the HRA and the city will not continue to work with developers to provide single family home ownership or residential opportunity at a much lower AMI. Um, sometimes with subsidies, uh, it's possible to hit 50 or 60% AMI, but this change from 110 to 115 makes it easier for potential developers to pair potential HRA and city of Bloomington funds with state Minnesota housing funds and other funds that are currently available for single family uh, residential. Section 915, Affordable Housing Tools and Incentives. The staff recommends that the City Council may, at its sole discretion, allow the use of incentives for developments that create or preserve fewer than 20 units where the City Council finds it to be in the public's interest. This would encourage single family development and give the city council the opportunity to preserve an existing NOAA development that had fewer than 20 units. This could be a more substantial deviation from the original intent of the ordinance, but in light of the council's um, strong recommendations that the HRA add more tools to promote single family home ownership. We believe that um, in order for single family home ownership to be considered realistically within the city, that less than uh, less than 20 unit development um, would be required. Another important part of the change to 915 is to um, to allow developments to seek flexibility through the ordinance by submitting an affordable housing plan, which is already required, outlining unit, unit counts, flexibility measures, guarantees of, affordable, and of, of affordability that would be, as is now, approved by the community development director and recommended to be considered for approval by the city council. Based on the evidence specified in the affordable housing plan, the community development director must make a recommendation to the city council to approve any alternative, any additional request in the tools and incentives, and it must provide as much or more affordable housing at the same or lower income levels. Once again, flexibility is in the spirit of the ordinance and this allows the city council to make to uh, adopt those um, recommendations for a particular development at its sole discretion. The ordinance changes 1916.2 to 0.5 are all in support of redevelopment on smaller sites. Site area reduction, site width reduction, impervious surface area increase, and open space reduction. Staff recommends adding this flexibility um, in order to expand the number of smaller sites um, within the city of Bloomington um, to be able to produce affordable housing at the density um, would allow the project to be viable and, and move forward. As I mentioned earlier, 8012 Old Cedar um, is an um, example of this, as would be um, the city uh, owned property near Queen and American. Um, another example of the same site size would be the option agreements that the HRA formally had for 98th and Nicollet. However, when the HRA learned that increased density um, was not the preference of the HRA and the city council on those lots um, with some other factors, um, that would be an example of where the city council would not want to utilize their discretion to, um, to support uh, these incentives. Think of them like density incentives, um, although under under the zoning um, code, they they are slightly different and do um, different things. Ordinance uh, change nine point eighteen with the height bonus. 
Um, this staff recommends approval of a greater height bon bonus of one additional story and 10 additional feet above the height limit set forward in the city's height limit maps. This adds value for more market interest um, in, for example, three level townhomes, and it also provides increased density to larger developments that lower per unit costs and allow for deeper affordability. 9.19 parking reduction staff recommends changing the parking reduction for a development with 20% of its units qualifying as extremely low income for a 25% parking reduction when outside the transit area and a 50% parking reduction within a designated transit area. Given the city priorities for units at 30% AM and below, this change is meant to further incentivize inclusion of these types of units in projects. Currently, the ordinance allows for a, um, a nine, a 10 to 40% parking reduction, increasing deeper levels. So where previously 9% of the units would need to be affordable to access the parking reduction, it is now 20 percent of the units. So we're looking for more affordability in order to to access this incentive. 9.20 enclosed parking space conversion allowance. Staff recommends that a development with 20% of its unif units qualifying as extremely low income affordable housing would qualify to convert 100% of required enclosed parking spaces to unenclosed parking spaces. Once again, given city priorities for units 30% AM, I and below, this change is meant to further incentivize inclusion of these types of units in the projects. Include enclosed parking is a significant driver of development costs. Some developers have argued that it could be a safety concern with, with visibility and that it definitely can be a concern um, with snow plowing. And um, just to note, the city council supported this change for Lindale Flat. 9.22 alternative exterior uh, materials allowance staff recommends adding engineered wood to the list. 9.23 storage space reduction. Staff recommends further flexibility for units with 20% of the units affordable at 50% AMI or below, including the 30% AMI category to reduce storage space requirements by 75%. Given the city's priorities for units at 50 and 30% AMI, the change is meant to further incentivize those types of units. Developers also report a significant reduction in requests for storage space, and that existing storage pace, space is underutilized. Many developers are working to incorporate much more storage space inside the units that, as well, which is uh, deemed to be more secure and more accessible. Um, currently, it's a 9% requirement um, of affordable units to, to access a 50% reduction. So this is not going all the way with 100% reduction in storage space, um, but incentivizing further reduction for the 50 and 30% AMI units. And um, with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Shulquist. Um, I would suggest um, that if anybody has any kind of broad questions, Let's ask them um, now, and then if there are any specific questions, what I would ask you to do, Ms. Schulquist, is quickly kind of go through each of the changes. We can have it up on the screen for a moment. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Olson. Uh, thank you. Uh, in terms of a broad question, uh, I was taking notes as we went here, but um, if if um, uh, Ms. Schilquist could give us a kind of an overview of, you mentioned the input uh, in, in general terms from developers uh, that was reflected quite a bit um, in other sources, but in terms of the process of making these recommendations, uh, who were the, the the players involved? Just just an overview summary. Please. Yeah, Chair Thorson and uh, Commissioner Olson. 
there um, were community engagement occurred um, through the three city council joint HRA study sessions between August and um, October of last year. The Twin, Twin Cities LISC hosted uh, a conversation with developers and lenders and a conversation with government philanthropic and nonprofit partners. We also brought the recommendations to the Bloomington Housing Action Team. The, um, all of the original stakeholders and all of the new developers and lenders and uh, philanthropic and nonprofit partners that came to the table since the launch of the ordinance um, were consulted in 2020. Additionally, um, we presented this information today at the Bloomington Housing Action Team, and we are working with the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association to bring together um, a, another uh, meeting with property owners and the Urban Land Institute to bring together another meeting with housing developers. Um, we will also, when the ordinance changes are published on Thursday, we will send out an email to all the former uh, list of stakeholders from when the opportunity housing ordinance was launched. Um, and I, you know, I must say that um, I am constantly getting feedback from property owners um, and developers uh, regarding current ordinance, how well it's working um, and, and then you know, also had received these minor recommendations for some clarifications and changes. Thank you. A uh, quick question following that. <clears throat> so there are going to be there. There are a couple, at least a couple of other stakeholder meetings coming up. Is that correct? Yes, um, I'm working with um, both Minnesota Multi Housing Associ Association and the Lur Urban Land Institute to try to encourage more attendance. Um, I, I, it's my personal belief that um, the developers and the property owners prefer speaking to us one on one than coming together. Um, but I do think it's important to provide that forum in addition um, to, you know, working with with the uh, property owners and and housing developers and and of course our philanthropic um, partners uh, and funders. Thank you. I, my my follow up question is. Do you expect any changes to these uh, proposed amendments as a result of those meetings? And if there are, will they be coming back to the HRA prior to going to council? If there were major changes, they would be coming back to the HRA. But I predict that major major changes would be a future amendment. Um, there, as I mentioned, the parking uh, analysis that um, the community development department and planning in particular is leading. Um, there's also, I know, um, on the work plan, a discussion of ADUs, um, alternative dwelling units. So, um, based on my experience working with this group of stakeholders over the past uh, several months, I don't anticipate that anything new would come up that. Um, would be pushed forward now as opposed to more thoroughly explored um, between now and when um, another um, an, when circumstances would necessitate um, any additional uh, changes in the future, but not at this time. And then did I hear correctly too that this is going before planning commission? Yes, it will go to planning commission on February 25th and the city council on March 8th. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Would there be an interest on, or a question on the, would there be interest on the part of the commissioner in stepping through each of these very quickly and giving us an opportunity on each one to ask questions or make comments or is everybody comfortable with what they've seen so far? Any feedback would be appreciated. Chair, this is Commissioner Lewis. Um, Commissioner Lewis. With, I'm, I'm comfortable with what I've seen so far. I would, I would not be opposed if people wanted to go through them, but I felt it was a pretty clear presentation. Okay, that's great. Um, I just want to make sure 
there's quite a bit there that if there's if if anybody wanted to go through any uh, you know with a finer a finer look, we we'd have the opportunity to do that. I do have uh, myself a question about I believe it was nine point one five, and that had to do with approvals by the city council and um, and community development director. I assume that those uh, you know come after discussion and. Uh, if needed, approval by the HRA board. I mean, the, those kinds of changes would would be uh, before our board at some point prior. Chair Thorson, thank you for that question. Uh, the the approval of the affordable housing plan under the ordinance as established and now uh, provides the community development director and this with the authority to recommend and the city council with the authority to approve. With that said, um, the community development director um, has at this time appointed me as staff as the opportunity housing advisor. So I work with um, all affordable housing, whether it's the HRA or the Port Authority to develop an affordable housing plan that is shared um, with the community development director, the HRA administrator or port authority administrator, planning manager, and you know many others on the leadership team within the city before it is then brought to the appropriate board, whether it would be the HRA or the port authority. Um, the planning commission obviously is necessary, not only for the affordable housing plan and the opportunity housing <clears throat> ordinance, but for um, permitting. And then on to the council for for final approval. Um, I believe that the HRA um, and the city council have the biggest input in approving the public assistance uh, tools and incentives out of the trust fund, whether it's tax increment financing or um, the affordable housing trust fund or or other um, options that um, require funding. So I hope that is clear um, as far as the process goes. Well, the ordinance rests the authority in the in the city council and the community development director. Um, there obviously are many boards, um, and especially uh, the HRA that um, that carries the project forward. In, it, it's especially the HRA commission. Do I saw your hand, Commissioner Olson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Maybe I've missed something recently, but I happened uh, as looking through uh, emails today, a, a recent posting from HR did not have a posting for the a permanent uh, fill of the uh, director of uh, community uh, development. Uh, I'm just wondering what the status is of that. Uh, not not a criticism of the of the interim, but I'm just uh, looking for uh, stability as we move forward. Yeah, Chair Olson, I defer to uh, HRA Administrator Coleman on this question. Thank you, Chair, Chair Thorson, Olson. Commissioner Olson, uh, Erica Coleman. Uh, the status of that is that um, they are conducting interviews for um, for that position. And so um, first and second round interviews are taking place. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Hoogie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thorson, I just had a, a little bit of a question on height, the height bonus. It's uh, ordinance change section 9.18. Uh, what, and this is uh, just a, maybe a stupid question, but do we know what the, uh, the height bonus is currently the height limit in the city of Bloomington? But Chair Thorson, uh, Commissioner Hu Kim, I, um, the, the existing height bonus um, currently allows one story um, or 10 feet. And um, the proposed amendment to the ordinance of um, an even greater height bonus of one additional story and additional 10 feet above um, above the height limit set forward in the city's height limits map. Um, I, not being a planner, I cannot provide you with um, more than um, as the ordinance reads, uh, but I do know uh, that uh, planning manager Glenn Markegaard and um, our now HRA um, 
part time planner, Mike Palermo. Um, believes that this is adding uh, to the incentives to allow for a greater use of the height bonus than has um, previously uh, been established in the ordinance. Excuse me, uh, excuse me real quick, Chair Thorson, Commissioner Huheen, if I could clarify a little bit on that. Um, so it actually depends on the area of the location within the city of Bloomington. So uh, the reason that it, the change is phrased this way, because planning definitely was a part of this, it depends on the location. So around um, where the airport is, there's an airport height limit. But um, other areas, it's six stories or 80 feet four stories or 60 feet, three stories or 50 feet, or two stories or 40 feet. So um, there is a map, a colored map, but you know when you look at it, it probably doesn't really come into play until we're talking about development, uh, specific development, so you can actually see what that adjustment of an additional story and 10 additional feet above 80, 60, 50, or 40 feet would look like. Chair Thorson, um, Administrator Coleman, Commissioner Hukim, each and every one of these incentives will be coming to the HRA and the City Council for recommendation for approval. So um, you will be able for every development that comes through to know what the what the added incentive would be for the height bonus for that particular property. Thank you. I, uh, I I appreciate knowing that because I'm sure that every circumstance will be quite, could be quite different, uh, particularly if we combine the um, uh, the height or increased density with perhaps uh, uh, lower setbacks. Um, of course, I personally would, as we get higher, I would like to see personally see more open space around the development. To make sure there's, you know, livable area, you know, around uh, with less density, maybe less need. So, but I, but I understand that each individual um, development will have its own unique characteristics. Um, help me out. I just have one quick question. I know there's a point at which affordability can change when you be when you go from, a, you know, certain number of stories to to greater. Uh, because it's more difficult to to affordably build, you know what I what I guess I call a, a stick built uh, unit, and I'm just wondering if if there is a sort of a magic number there where uh, you can go up to a certain height and still keep the uh, the construction type uh, affordable. And this is just for my own education. Yeah. Yes, Chair Thorson. Um, it depends on the development, of course, but it's traditionally up to six feet. With stick built before moving to, um, you know, more durable um, infrastructure. Uh, with that said, we have seen um, in the developments that have come through the HRA under the ordinance um, that that height limit um, has allowed a project to go, you know, from from 60 units to 80 units, or from 100 units to 120 units, and that makes a really big difference in the total development costs and the per unit costs. So it really, if you're looking at something within the ordinance that provides a big bang for the buck um, with um, lowering uh, per unit costs and providing, making, you know, incentivizing more affordable housing units, this one is um, a very important um, change. Um, it was it was a good bonus to start with, and we're just trying to um, deepen it to to allow um, allow the option to um, to have an even even greater height bonus. Thank you. I appreciate the information. Again, I wasn't um, I wasn't uh, uh, I am very much in support of this additional bonus. I'm just wondering how it affects uh, construction technique. I believe I saw Commissioner. Hugim's hand up, and I know I saw Commissioner Olson's up as well. Commissioner Hugim. Um, thank you, Chair Thorson. I was just, I had had my hand up just a little bit ago, and I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Coleman and Ms. Holquist for clarifying that. My concern was just, I know, like, with some of these developments, sometimes they go in some partially residential areas, and I just wanted to make sure that the height bonus was going to be specific to those areas. So. So residents weren't seeing something completely, you know, 
um, out of line. So I do appreciate the clarification. So thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner Hulakim. Commissioner Olson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would appreciate a little more fleshing out on the parking. I know we've talked about that a lot. We've seen um, uh, requests come in and aware that um, developers uh, see that as an opportunity for reducing costs. Uh, but but two two things. One, I believe, uh, Ms. Shokost, you commented about uh, Lindale uh, Flats, and I recall some of the specifics about um, uh, that as, as we were seeing the, the development plans. Um, but I'm wondering, I don't recall uh, in response to my question about the stakeholders uh, uh, that had input into all of this, how, how do the changes in parking uh, affect and how do uh, uh, residents uh, respond to um, uh, less enclosed or whatever? Um, Chair Thorson, Commissioner Olson, um, I believe your question is focused more on the enclosed parking space conversion than the parking reduction in general. So I will address that um, first. The um, when we had conversations um, with with property managers um, and and residents through the Bloomington um, Housing Action Team and the earlier the Bloomington Housing Coalition. Uh, Having a parking space was much more important than having an enclosed parking space and having an affordable unit also took precedence over having an enclosed parking space. Um, additionally, the, um, it seemed in BHAT today and in the past, um, residents are, are often equally concerned about how close the project is to bus and light rail transit and how often the bus service is um, near that development. One of the reasons we would like to um, focus density in certain areas, like the Gateway District in Lindale Avenue in particular, or over in the South Loop, is to try to increase density to provide more the metropolitan metro transit to, um, you know, really look at providing more um, alternative um, bus and, and LRT routes. So I think there's been a mix and um, this raises um, the number of units that are um, required to meet this, um, to, to access this parking space conversion from 9% to 20% um, of the units, uh, but it does allow 100% allow conversion from enclosed parking space to unenclosed parking space. Thank you, that was helpful. Thank you. Are there any further questions of staff on the proposed change? Okay. Any further staff comments? If not, we would be looking for a motion here. Commissioners, we're looking for a motion of approval if someone is so inclined. Commissioner Lewis, um, I move to recommend approval of the amendments to the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Do we have a second? Commissioner Hukim seconds. Uh, motion by Commissioner Lewis, second by uh, Commissioner Hukim. We'll now do the roll call vote. Commissioner Hukim. Aye. Commissioner Lewis. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Thorson is an aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Nice work. I know we've talked about some the need for some of these along the way. And it continues to be exciting to see the, the progress and the interest on the part of developers. Um, on to discussion item, item uh, five point or 6.1 HRA programs update. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Brian Hartman, uh, just a couple three program updates for you this evening. 
Um, as you remember, for when we set our calendar for this year, we'll do program updates at the first meeting of every month and then development updates at the second. Um, our Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, we do not yet have a budget from HUD. Um, they are in the process of um, working through the budget budgeting process for that program. So we won't expect to see anything probably until the end of March is my guess. But given that, we um, have taken a look at our available funding and have determined that we can um, make selections off our waiting list. I think I mentioned this the last time we met um, and we've selected 25 people off our 2014 list. And we've actually heard from 20 of them, which is a pretty high return rate um, when we make selections off our waiting list. So it's exciting to be able to um, offer assistance to those families. So we'd be working with them and issuing them vouchers uh, here early spring. Um, our single family home improvement loan program, as you know, the city council approved $600,000 in strategic priorities funds um, to the, the this program and the neighborhood program, we call it, and that we have had that transfer from the finance department. So it's in our HRA account and we are actively committing those funds now. We also have seen an uptick in repayment of old loans. Um, both for the neighborhood program and also for the CDBG program, which is good. Um, that was pretty quiet last year. Our anticipated uh, program income from repayments was, was down from what we anticipated. So we're hoping that that trend continues. And as you know, as those loans are paid off, we can make new loans with that return money. Uh, and then lastly, at our next meeting, uh, the second meeting in February, representatives from uh, Senior Community Service will be present. Um, we'll be approving their 2021 uh, contract for HRA funding. Um, so Deb Taylor and her staff will be here to be present a short presentation on their program and the uh, important work they are doing and how it has changed during the pandemic. So um, look forward to uh, seeing them, of course, as always. Um, so that's all I have, uh, Mr. Chair, for program updates and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions of staff? Great update. Uh, hearing no questions, seeing no hands, um, move on to item 6.2 of the bylaws discussion as we uh, continue down that, uh, that discussion on this other very important item. Yes, thank you, Chair Thorson, Erica Coleman, HR Administrator. So uh, we did have a really good discussion um, last time, discuss, starting with the bylaws. Um, and there were a few uh, questions of commissioners, of staff and or legal counsel. So in your packet, um, in the public packet, there is um, a HRA Act and Opening Meeting Law Provisions. I just want to thank our general counsel, Carla, Peterson for taking the time to really put that together. It gave um, information around some of the questions that were posed, as well as the why for, um, for quite a few things that were included in the bylaws. I think the easiest way to do it this time is to share my screen. So Myra, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because um, last time it was really difficult trying to follow along. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. So, um, let's see. This is the marked up version that was included in the packet. Uh, you did get a PDF um, version of this, so it might've been a little complicated to look at. Um, I just want to um, go through and show that everything that's in here is what we discussed, um, as well as we did add the section for emergency meetings as discussed, and the language that was added was recommended by general legal counsel. And this information comes straight from the, um, stat the statute, so it's statutory language. And so, um, let's see. Everything else uh, except for Section K, 
I do want to highlight this because it's Journal of Votes. Uh, this was also information provided by General Counsel that stated we need to have a journal of votes. And so the votes of the commissioners on an action taken in a meeting required to be open to the public must be recorded in a journal kept for that purpose. The vote of each commissioner must be recorded on each appropriation of money, except for payments of judgments, claims, and amounts fixed by statute. Um, so that is something that has been added to the bylaws that we did not discuss, but it is uh, statutory. And it is something that uh, as the administrator, I would cause to make sure it's taken care of um, by us on the staff side. And so it's a, just a notification for, for com commissioners to know. And so we can go to right where we were. I believe we left off at Article 3, Commissioners, Officers, Administrators, Staff. Um, and we, uh, I don't believe we have an update yet regarding the appointment process as notated here um, that the mayor of Bloomington with the approval of the city council is responsible for appointing the HRA board commissioners and our previous discussion was to look into that and to uh, see exactly what is um, the actual process and verify the practice with the council secretary. Um, so next is terms of service. HRA commissioner shall be appointed for five year term. Each vacancy in an unexpired term shall be filled for the remainder of the term for which the original appointment was made. That again is statutory uh, language uh, for the five year term. And then we ended on uh, city council members that any city council member of the city of Bloomington may be appointed and may serve as a commissioner of the HRA. This is this, this is a discussion by all of the HRA commissioners. And I just want to um, let you know that I also have asked uh, city, the city manager in terms of what, uh, what does the city manager, city leadership, city council, uh, do they have any guidance or input on uh, either way? on having a council member as a voting member commissioner or having a council member as a non voting member commissioner. So when I hear back, I will report back to the board about whatever um, input I, I received. So are there any questions about any of that or any of the topics from last week? Commissioners, any questions on that so far? Uh, commissioner Olson. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to say, uh, uh, maybe more fitting just before we started, but um, I was really uh, appreciative of the work that uh, staff and uh, uh, legal counsel Carl, Carla Peterson uh, did. Uh, this was uh, a lot of, of good work and it's uh, tough for uh, needing to use my glasses more often. It was uh, uh, very helpful how you prepared us for tonight. Thank you, including what we are going through now. Thank you. Any other? Not we can proceed. All right, great. Thank you very much, Chair Thorson, and thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Olson. Uh, so, Section B, officers. There are no proposed changes to this section. The officers of the HRA shall consist of a chair, a vice chair, a secretary, and such other officers as shall from time to time be chosen and appointed by the commissioners. Does anyone have any thoughts, questions, or proposed changes as staff has none? All right. Any thoughts? Okay, I hear or see none, so I'll move on to the next section. So you'll see here that the, um, the numbering changes and the reason that it changes because officers is the section and the subsections of chair, vice chair, and secretary shall be numbered and not lettered. They're not different sections. So that's the first change. And then the chair shall be selected by the commissioners and shall preside at all meetings of the commissioners. And proposed change of an addition, as required, the chair shall be responsible for certification of official actions of the HRA. Um, that is adding that to the bylaws, and that would be uh, the signature process by the chair. Any questions or thoughts on that addition? Hearing 
Hearing none. All right. Number two, vice chair. There are no proposed changes to the vice chair um, subsection. The vice chair shall be selected by the commissioners and shall preside at all meetings of the commissioners in the absence of the chair and shall perform such other duties as may be as may be assigned by the commissioners. In the case of death, reti retirement or resignation of the chair, the vice chair shall perform and be vested with all the duties and powers of the chair until such time that a new chair is chosen by the commissioners. Three, secretary. So this section changes just a tad. Um, striking the commissioner shall select the commissioner who shall act in the capacity as a secretary and updating it to state the secretary shall be selected by the commissioners, period. The secretary shall be responsible for attesting official actions of the HRA. And so that is just the witness and sign witnessing by signature process that actually is happening. Um, but this is putting making it clear in the bylaws. Any thoughts, questions? Okay. So now we'll move on to section C. Uh, the reason it's changed is because section B and then included the subsections of chair, vice chair, and secretary. So now this is section C administrator. Um, there's not many changes. We're keeping the commissioner shall appoint an administrator who shall not be a commissioner, comma, but who may be an employee of the city. The administrator shall be responsible for one, securing, supervising, and directing any personnel required for work to be accomplished by the HRA and removing the uh, semicolon and putting a period. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then for number two, striking, providing for the taking of and preparing and adding recording of the minutes for each meeting of the HRA. And adding a period. And then three, maintaining any appropriate files as deemed necessary by the commissioners, including files of minutes, publication of meetings, and meeting agendas. Four, the general administration and financial management of the affairs of the HRA pursuant to policies determined by the commissioners, striking and and the semicolon and adding a period. And then five, any assigned responsibility, any other responsibilities assigned by the chair of commissioners. Are there any uh, questions, updates, changes, or additions to the duties uh, set forth here for the administrator? Any questions or comments on this section? All right. Section D, staff services. There um, are no proposed changes to staff services. If the HRA uses personnel under the control of the city manager, a contract for services shall be entered into with which clearly designates the services provided. And as you know, we did do the contract uh, for services before revisiting the bylaws. So that is in place and has been agreed upon by the commissioners um, and is reflective of the bylaws. Um, and we can revisit if there needs to be any updates, but I believe we won't have any updates to the service staff services contract. Uh, as we recalled before, Article 4, quorum and voting, we did combine that with a previous section. So this strikeout is not uh, deleting it, it was moving it to a previous section that we've already discussed. And this is just a mistake on my part. This should say Article 4. Um, there we go. So finance and contracts. Um, the, the first changes in section A, fiscal years, just changing calendar from a capitalized C to a lowercase C and adding S on the end of undertaking. So the calendar year shall be the fiscal year of the, of the HRA. However, other fiscal years for specific purposes or undertakings of the HRA may be established as required or desirable. I think this was a question before our year is January to December, uh, our fiscal year, our calendar year. Um, section B budget, the following budgetary proceedings are hereby established. So there is an addition with section, excuse me, subsection one to make it more clear and align with the previous changes we did um, earlier. And a budget shall be prepared by the administrator who shall present the budget to the commissioners of the HRA for consideration. 
striking the first meeting of August and changing it to at a regular meeting of the HRA in September of each year. Uh, number two, subsection two, there were no changes. Uh, this is detailing what the budget shall include. And then number three, subsection three, um, just for more clarity, after full consideration of the budget, the commissioners of the HRA shall give their approval to it and the chair of the HRA shall cause, and this actually wasn't, probably wasn't worded correctly, shall cause the budget to be submitted to the city council not later than the city council meeting in December of each year. So it is reflecting the changes and dates that we have already outlined. Any questions or comments? Okay, section C, there are no changes proposed by staff. This is the investments of the HRA. The investments of the HRA fund shall be the responsibility of the administrator in accordance with the investment policy approved by the commissioners of the HRA. Any questions? All right, section D, contracts and procurement. Um, this was just um, making it clear that subsection one is general, uh, that all construction work and work of demolition and clearing contracts for services or for repairs, maintenance and replacements and every purchase of equipment supplies or materials and contracts therefore shall be in accordance with the procurement policy of the HRA. Section two, uh, this is capitalization of approval of contract by attorney. And then one addition, which uh, are two additions, but except for the purchase of expendable office supplies and those standardized program contracts from the local, state, or federal government that in the judgment of the administrator, do not require and it's uh, striking attorney and saying legal review. Uh, no contract should be made by the HRA through any officer or employee except in writing and approved as to form by the attorney for the HRA. And then adding which approval need not be evidenced by the attorney's signature on the contract. That is for clarification purposes. Uh, there really has been conversation on whether there needs to be an attorney's signature to show. Uh, approval or review, and we have uh, staff has suggested or recommended that there does not require to have an additional signature on the contract to show approval and review. Um, subsection three execution of contracts. There are no proposed changes to the execution of the contracts, uh, which execution is is the assigned of the administrator. Um, or an assignee of the administrator in the absence of the administrator. Section E, disbursements. Uh, again, subsection one is just capitalization, federal funds, and there's no other proposed changes. Subsection two, official depository, uh, just to update with the times, adding or wire transfer. Um, it states it shall be dispersed only by check uh, which could put us in a bind. So we have or wire transfer uh, to add that um, technology. Subsection three checks, there are no proposed changes. Uh, the signature on the checks will remain the same and the checks will be drawn on the bank accounts of the HRA. Uh, article five, powers and duties. The, here we're just capitalizing chapter of Minnesota statutes chapter 469. Uh, no other proposed changes. And then Article 6, amendments, stating these bylaws may, may be amended at any meeting of the HRA provided that notice of such proposed amendment is provided to each commissioner of the HRA at least 10 days prior to such meeting. The amendment of the bylaws and the vote required shall be in accordance with that, with that set forth under the voting provisions of these bylaws. And that would be um, us reviewing, discussion, discussing at this time and bringing back a clean and red line version for the commissioners to vote on at the annual meeting on March 9th, which would be more than 10 days notice um, for when we put the notice out for that. So I will stand for any questions, comments, um, but that is the end of our bylaws. Okay, Mr. Chair. Uh, commissioners, uh, yeah, Mr. Is that Chair, Commissioner Lewis. Yes, it is. Thank you. Sorry, I should put my um, 
video back on, so I'm a live person. Um, I just want to compliment um, uh, the staff and the work that went into this. I appreciated the clarification and the simplification of a lot of things and the removal of unnecessary language. I like, you know, I thought that was really great. I made a little comment here, cleaning it up. I thought it looked really good and I just want to share that. And that's it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I forgot to unmute when I talked. Commissioner oh, Olson. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Lewis. Uh, one of the things that we've spent a fair amount of time talking about uh, was the fact that uh, not that we need, uh, I mean, it's good for Bloomington to be unique for good reasons. Um, and this could be one of them, but we have a more um, complicated, detailed um, bylaws than is apparently the norm in Minnesota. And so we talked about moving some things to policy, and I think we've done that a little bit, but. I'm just wondering uh, the moment since since we've talked about that, uh, if there could be another pass by staff and legal to uh, to just determine if there are some things that would be better off uh, dealt with as policy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Thorson, Commissioner Olson. Um, outside of what we discussed, uh, staff has not uh, brought forward anything else that should be that would better fit as policy. Uh, but Carla Peterson, our general counsel, is on the um, on the meeting, and I will ask Carla: Is there anything that, um, in your opinion, should be a policy that we have left in the bylaws? Oh, I'm trying to start my video, but it doesn't seem to want to let me. Um, I'm here though today, <laughs> uh, Eric. Maybe you can scroll up a little bit. I, I think what we discussed to move. Um, was maybe some of the agenda items. And so I believe if you just go a little higher up here. Yeah, so stop there if you would. So I think this is the agenda, if I'm remembering correctly, for the regular meetings. Oh, scroll up just a tad more. I want to see the title of the section. Yes, regular meetings. So I think we propose to move that into policy. If we go down a little bit further, there's also, or maybe it's up further, but somewhere in here there's an agenda for it was still left in there down here in the voting wait no voting we did actually it must be above i'm sorry I, <laughs> i'm trying to direct erica with without having the printed copy sitting in front of me okay yes conduct of business at the annual meeting so we discussed moving that into a policy document which i don't believe we have started yet um and that was something i don't normally see that specific of an agenda in bylaws um, it's up to the commissioners if they would like to move the specific agenda for the regular meetings into a policy document. I believe we're still showing that as in the bylaws. Other than that, I think all of the changes that uh, staff has discussed and recommended are helpful. I agree with Commissioner Lewis. We're, we're cleaning it up, simplifying it, getting it into a modern age with some of the revisions. Uh, so I think great job. Thank you. Um, I do have one broad question having to do with the bylaws stating that the, the uh, commissioners are appointed by the city council, you know, period. And then we've had some discussions uh, here about, and, and I and realize there's more input to come, but about um, whether or not a commissioner uh, should be a city council member uh, and other discussions about what the makeup could be uh as a possible discussion in in our policy it sounds like versus bylaws but how does i am curious carla from your perspective how any uh anything we put into either our bylaws or our policy wouldn't that be as it relates to the appointment of commissioners wouldn't that be overridden by whatever the council decides when they decide to appoint commissioners for an opening they're not, well, held, to, they're not held to anything we um, uh, I put it under the bylaws, well, certainly in our policy. Well, I think here that the most pertinent thing is the state statute, which was included in your package 46903, 
subdivision six specifically talks about appointment and says the commissioner shall be appointed by the mayor with the approval of the governing body. So we are not able to change that. We are able to change um, whether the number of, of city council members, we can decide that as a body as to um, whether we want, as Erica has pointed out, a city council member as a voting member or a city council member as an ex officio member or whether we want to limit the number of council members, but we are not able to change the statutory provision that says the commissioners are appointed by the mayor. Although from last um, meeting, it sounds as though perhaps this is not completely following that practice. And I believe uh, Administrator Coleman indicated staff is continuing to follow up with the city on that. So we should, I think, continue to follow up with that and make sure we understand the process and if we want to uh, make further adjustments in the bylaws, we certainly could do that. I would suggest that would be a provision that would probably be most appropriate in the bylaws rather than a policy if we were going to um, define the makeup of the of the board of commissioners more more um, definitively. Thank you. I appreciate it. I and I, I understand what's in the what's in the statute as it relates to. Um, uh, how the commissioners are appointed, appointed by, I, I said council, but appointed by the a mayor and approved by the council. But I'm saying, should we, as a board, decide that we want uh, our um, bylaws to state that, um, you know, uh, uh, for example, a council person would be ex officio, um, do, can't the council this was, this was sort of the core of my question, given that the, the mayor appoints the commissioners and the council approves them, can't then the council act outside of anything we might put in the bylaws because of state statute? I don't know if I'm being clear, but that's kind of the gist of what I'm hoping to get answered. Yes, Chair Thorson, commissioners, I believe you're asking, can we um, in our bylaws specify something that can be overridden by the city council? I have not uh, specifically analyzed that question, but I believe that you have the ability to specify in your bylaws, again, whether you have council members or not. From you know our research that we've done on other HRAs, there are certainly other HRAs in the state that provide in their bylaws how many council members can be commissioners of the HRA. So at least in practice, that's operating. Um, but we don't know necessarily whether uh, a future city council might uh, choose to appoint a council member, provided we move away from that, and that that and that they would have the legal ability to do that. Is that correct? That's correct. And it, ideally, and I've done this before um, with other HRAs, uh, specifically with working with a county HRA recently. The, the preferred practice to do what you're describing would be to have both the city council and the HRA board adopt these parameters as to the makeup of the HRA board so that, that they're saying they also agree that they're only going to appoint X number of council members to your board. You agree that that's the limit on your board and then to change that would take future action by the board of commissioners and the city council. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Commissioner Olson, I saw your hand. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, following on that a little bit, um, we, there's a couple of issues that were discussed, including in the comments on the right uh, margin, which I appreciated, uh, that we haven't dealt with tonight. And so uh, I know we're waiting on uh, um, uh, reports from uh, the city administration and, and so on, but uh, I, th I think uh, this is a time for us to uh, resolve those, however. And um, I'm, I'm, not, um, uh, I'm not critical of how, how um, city council input happens, but in terms of representation for housing and redevelopment, we really don't have provisions in our bylaws and certainly not in our practice uh, to work toward having uh, representation from people affected by HRA actions. And uh, one way that we've talked about it uh, is um, in terms of uh, going uh, up to five, uh, six or seven members 
And I believe um, perhaps a comment from you, Carla, on the right margin at one point that, uh, that that's something that you could promote and I believe, or not, I don't know if the word is promote, but to pursue and, uh, and that you indicated that it was not likely to be a controversial thing with the legislature and that we could uh, increase to six or seven people. And that would permit us to, um, uh, or the council, I guess, actually to uh, permit them to uh, appoint people to this commission uh, that, that could be uh, with some guidelines about having representation. And I know uh, bottom line from my time on the, on the council is that finding the best uh, people uh, for serving on, in any capacity uh, by appointment um, needs to be seeking the best. And, and I think it, it's really time for us to indicate that, uh, in my opinion, that like in some others, like on the um, um, diversity uh, commission, uh, that's not the right word, but, and, um, and some others that youth are, are uh, one spot needs to be designated for youth. And I think that the council, uh, maybe from uh, discussion that we pass on to them, uh, that, that we need to uh, put on the table that it's important uh, for a body like this to have uh, voice votes uh, and again, potentially ex officio and not voting, but I think we need to put that on the table and pursue it. So I would, I, what I'm basically saying is I think we need to uh, pursue uh, particularly the issue with the legislature about adding members, uh, discuss that and move that forward to the council. And then also discuss um, uh, the number of, of members from the council, uh, whether they have uh, a vote or not. And I don't have a real strong opinion on that if it's only one council member. But right now, a council member on the commission has a vote, uh, uh, one of seven on the council and one of five uh, in this body. So uh, just like us, us to uh, stay with us until we resolve it better than we have it at this point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Olson. I was going to bring up the same thing. I do want to see us uh, having a full discussion on uh, the idea of expanding the board and uh, 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 requesting of the of the processes that would take place to to begin that process, whether it's reaching out to our uh, legislative uh, coalition to see if there's support as a beginning and sponsoring or whether it's done through lobbyists or whatnot. But I, I completely agree. We want to have those discussions um, and they may, uh, um, you know, require that we revisit the bylaws. I think this is an excellent process we've gone through to clean up the bylaws, but you are absolutely right. There's some ideas we talked about that uh, we want to make sure uh, that we continue to focus on those uh, as, uh, as part of, and that could certainly be a part of our, our next strategic planning meeting, because I think that's, that is a, uh, certainly expanding the board and expanding the diversity is a strategic priority or, you know, could, is, is part of that process. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Olson. Um, any other comments on this? Any other comments from commissioners? Any other questions? If not, this, uh, this uh, discussion will continue and uh, there will be a vote on the change of the bylaws at our uh, annual business meeting, correct? No action needed tonight. Thank you, Chair Thorson. Uh, no you. action needed tonight and it would be a vote uh, at the annual meeting, uh, but you would be made available of answers to the questions that we're able to get answers to discussion or um, points of clarification with the city council and city leadership, as well as a clean and red line version to review beforehand. Uh, Mr. Thank Chair. you. Uh, Commissioner Olson. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Coleman. I, um, Administrator Coleman, um, did, did what you say indicate that our next meeting, we would have a cleaned up copy um, with the red line or whatever uh, that we have discussed, well, red line, but also that 
that the issue that uh, Mark and I just talked about would would uh, there would be some response from whoever in the city um, would be uh, uh, important to get their input to. Did you say that? Thank you, Chair Thorson, Commissioner Olson. I did not promise, but I do expect that by our next regularly scheduled meeting, which would be February 23rd, I should have responses to all of the questions posed. Uh, not to say that we'll have a solidified um, re solidified uh, point or point of, um, what's the word, coordination when we come together, um, but I should expect to have responses by our next regularly scheduled meeting in two weeks on February 23rd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, looking at the agenda, looks like we are at the end of our agenda. Uh, at this point, if there's no other discussion, I would look. You accidentally muted yourself, Chair. Oh, I saw you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I see no other items on the agenda for this evening. Um, if, if there's no other, other discussion, I would look for a motion to adjourn this evening. Uh, Commissioner Olson uh, moves that we adjourn at this time. Commissioner Lewis, second. Motion by Olson, second by Lewis uh, to adjourn the meeting. I will now do a roll call vote. Commissioner Hukim. Aye. Commissioner Lewis. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. And Commissioner Olson or Commissioner Thorson and I, uh, meeting is now adjourned. Thank you again, everyone. Appreciate.